I hope you have your Bibles, and I hope you found Matthew 5 in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, talk with me. We can get you one. But we have it on the screens for you. The text is on the screen in case you don't have access to it where you're sitting. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read these verses. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And how we need this Word today to chart a course, a path, through the quagmire of the LGBT challenge. Thank you. Be seated. If you have listened to news at all in recent months, you know that Christianity is under attack, I would suggest, under attack more intensely and fiercely around the world than it has been since the days of the Roman Empire. Some might argue and say, well, there was a time in the medieval ages when it was under attack as well. But the intensity, the barbarity, that is imposed upon Christianity by groups like ISIS and these other offshoots basic of a, of, a, of, a, of a Muslim hostility, assault Christianity, and only this last week or two, almost 150 students approximately in Nigeria shot dead simply because they answered the question. The question was, are you Muslim or Christian? And they said, Christian, and shot dead where they stood. Probably the last words on their lips, Christian. Well, we're seeing an inroads being made in our nation of, of a, a preference shown to Islam. Uh, we have a president who can't say anything bad about Islam and can't say anything good about Christianity. And so we're seeing the encroaching of that, and it, it remains to be seen in the future years what will happen if blood will be spilt here on a regular basis. It has been spilt some. But if Christian blood will be spilt here, as it's being spilt around the world. What we are facing also in a, in a sort of new front is the attack on Christianity. And it is focused on Christianity of the lesbian uh, gay, bisexual, transgender uh, group in our nation. Estimates are that such people make up about 3% of the population. And yet they have a very powerful lobby effect. They've gained the hearing of the media so that the media is pro-LGBT. They've gained the halls of the universities, so that universities, by and large, are pro-LGBT. They're gaining political ground, so that those who are pro-this are adamantly pro-this, and in politics, those who are against it are deafeningly silent. I read a statistic the other day that said 61% of young Republicans those voting age in 18 up into the 20s, 61% believe that same-sex marriage is all right. What are we to do? My prayer is that we will be wise, like the sons of Issachar described in the Old Testament. We're told that they were men who were able to understand, to discern the times in which they lived, and know by God's direction what Israel ought to do. Well, my prayer today is as we look at this, and, and it, we, we cannot exhaust this in one message, but I hope, I hope that we'll chart a path, open a dialogue in this message 
to know what Bethel ought to do. It seems to me that there are two obvious sides in this. One is the pro-LGBT group that has that agenda. Uh, the left identifies with this very much so, pushes it, promotes it, and would call anyone who disagrees, in other words, anyone who would, who would not embrace lesbianism, that is two women loving one another in a way that only a man and a woman should love one another, gay or homosexual men, two men loving one another in a way that only a husband and wife should love one another, bisexual, the person who, a woman who would love women and men in that way and a man who would love men and women in that way, and transgender people who, who are convinced or have been convinced that while they may be biologically male, there's a, there's a female in there wanting to get out and so they undergo uh, transgender surgery. Or if con conversely, a woman who believes there's a man, she's a man and needs to be, uh, to address this surgically. And so people would say, if you do not embrace this, if you do not applaud this, if you do not promote this, if you do not endorse this, if you do not speak out for it, then you are a hater. You are a bigot. There's another side, though. People who are rancorous, vitriolic, who spew forth all kinds of unkind things toward the LGBT crowd. The most obvious, the most extreme, the, on the farthest right you can get, I think, is the Westboro Baptist Church, who hold up signs, terrible signs, God hates fags. Fags burn in hell. Ugly, hateful, vindictive, There are politicians on the right who use this issue and are antagonistic to the LGBT crowd in hopes of garnering support from conservatives and evangelical Christians. Neither one of these groups has the way for us. Neither one of these groups should be followed by us. Rather, we should go to the scriptures and read the words of our Lord, the words of the apostles. What would the Lord have us to do? And so the text that I just read a few moments ago, where Jesus is taking an ancillary commandment, love your neighbor. says that's not enough. You've heard that it was said. You've been taught by the Pharisees, by the religious leaders, to love your neighbor. And the definition of neighbor, of course, taught by those that Jesus was referencing, is that a fellow Jew would be my neighbor. Jesus would blow that apart in his parable of the Good Samaritan and show that all my fellow men are my neighbor. But Jesus says, not only love your neighbor, and certainly not hate your enemy. That was the rest of the commandment. You're, you have the right, the Pharisees would teach, to, to love those who love you, and to hate those who are your enemy. Brothers and sisters, I'm afraid that there are too many professing Christians who live right there today on this topic who love those who agree with them and hate those who would stand up for and promote and try to advance the LGBT agenda. But we've got to get out of verse 43 and into verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
Now, it might be questioned, why would we call these folks our enemies? It should not be because we see them as enemies, though we would say that they are antagonistic to the cross of Christ, but it is because they themselves have declared us the enemy. That makes them our enemies. They themselves have said that Christianity, conservative Christianity, evangelical Christianity, Bible-believing Christianity stands in the way of them having the freedom of having the, the practice the civil rights that granted to them, as they would say, by the Constitution. And so here we stand. Jesus says that if we will love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, that we'll be sons and daughters, I would say, of our Father in heaven. And he calls us to remember some things about God, the nature of God. He causes the Son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Such is our God. We're not the only ones blessed by God. Common grace is shed abroad. One of the great patriotic hymns, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. And he does that. Common grace, mercy, upon the land. We know that as this position advances, if it takes a dominant place in culture, we know what awaits, and we can read Romans 1 to find that out. When in verse 18 and following, Paul says, the wrath of God is abiding upon those who sin. And he talks about how what a society looks like when God gives them over. And I would suggest to you that short of a spiritual awakening coming to this land, that this nation, not because of you and me necessarily, but because of those in high places who make decisions, judges who make decisions, professors who, who teach, politicians who enact law, because they have turned their backs on God. And when you turn your back on God, God will give you over. And you can read Romans 1 sometime to see what that looks like, where that which is natural is surrendered for the unnatural. That even when you know to do good, you would prefer to do evil. That's where we live, folks. That's the America we live in. You can go back 30, 40 years and say, I never saw this coming. If you go back far enough and you trace the history of the development of this LBGT movement, early on it was simply, just regard us. Just, just regard us. We are who we are, don't, don't hurt us. And then the next cry was, just treat us as equals. Don't treat us as some sort of substandard human species. All we want is to be treated as equal. So that today the cry is, embrace us. Endorse our agenda. Or pay the price. Now in this country the price is not death. Not yet. But it will be fines, jail time, losing your livelihood. The scripture talks about a day coming when those who do not have the mark of the beast on them will not be able to buy or sell. And at least a mark of the beast is an embracing of the LBGT agenda. They've hijacked some things. They hijacked the rainbow, beautiful symbol of the promise of hope in God's mercy. It's been hijacked. The word gay has been hijacked. Perfectly good word. Don we now in gay apparel. 
Fala lá, fala lá. Hijacked. It is a, it is a sinister, subtle approach to taking over the culture. Now why? Well, sin does that, by the way. Sin is, sin is never content to be alone as sin. Sin wants partners. Sin loves company. We say misery loves company. Sin loves company. Also because the very nature of this sinful expression, a sin like other sins in many ways, the nature of the sinful expression is that there, there is no procreation. Two lesbians cannot procreate another lesbian, girl, or homosexual boy. The same with two homosexual men. They must have this agenda embraced because they want new recruits. They want new converts. They want our children. We're in an interesting day, a brave new world, where now children of gay or lesbian marriages are breaking completely away from that. I don't know if you remember 25 years ago the book that made a lot of headlines as it was finding its way on public school library shelves, Heather Has Two Mommies. Remember that book, anybody? 25th anniversary. The Heather in that book, who's, who's a real person, her name was Heather, has rejected that lifestyle, has become a follower of Jesus Christ, is married today with children, and she talks about the heartache and the pain of growing up without a father figure and how she still struggles with that and the, and the confusion of growing up with two mother figures in her life or a woman trying to play the father figure. And more and more that's coming out. We're finding out through studies that, that the whole lesbian homosexual condition is not genetic. It is dispositional. Oftentimes cultivated in homes where children are sinned against in horrible ways. And the devil uses that to draw them into this lifestyle. And it's growing. And it's not going to die down anytime soon. So what are you and I to do? The two texts we read, we read one together, Romans 12. The driving force, the beat of love. The same in Matthew 5. But I say to you, love your enemies. So first of all, and it's wonderful when you get in the body of Christ and you begin to share iron sharpening iron with one another in a conversation this morning before the service. Talking with Brother Norman, this phrase, lead with love, came out. Lead with love. What's a Christian to do? Because brothers and sisters, we're going to be called upon some in, informally and socially, some formally, as I believe that churches across this country are going to be challenged to embrace this or pay the price. How are we going to respond? We're going to lead with love. I came across an article out of Desiring God that I would encourage you to check out. It's by Jonathan Parnell, written last year about this time, Why Homosexuality is Not Like Other Sins. And he takes 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 10, and 11 there where Paul talks about these sins, these sinful conditions that would not inherit the kingdom of God. Thieving, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, swindling. And of all the list of sins, and then Paul goes on to say, and such were some of you, but you were washed. There is a way out of sin by the grace of God. You see, those who will argue that this is a genetic predisposition doom the people to live in this disposition. 
But if we can speak lovingly about this being a sinful condition, just like any sinful condition, adultery, lust, you can be delivered from your sins by the grace of God. And so we must cultivate a tenderness in our hearts to say to those who want to push this agenda upon us, I love you, and it's in love that I must say to you, you are wrong. Our purpose statement is that we're to follow Christ, love God, love others, and serve the world. And the only way we can serve the world is serving them with a loving heart. If we serve begrudgingly, then it's nothing. Jesus says, what, what have you got there? But if in love we serve, in love we stoop to wash the feet of sinners. Speak in love, lead with love, that they would see the love of Christ in us because you see, bakeries are gonna be challenged if they're distinctly run by Christians. They already have been. Florists are gonna be challenged if they're distinctly run by Christians. They already have been. Some have been shut down. Wedding planners will be challenged if they're distinctly Christian. And churches will be challenged on the topic of weddings to force the issue in an attempt to see churches in this country fined and shut down or embrace and compromise. We need to learn to say no matter how belligerent no matter how aggressive an LGBT person or proponent may be, I love you. I'm a sinner. I struggle with sin. I struggle with inconsistency. I, I repent of my sins. I ask God's forgiveness. I love you. And it's because I love you that I must say to you that you are wrong. Your position is wrong. Your lifestyle is wrong. And then, lovingly bear the consequence. Now we're in America where a person can have his or her day in court, by and large. And to see how aggressive and purposeful and malignant, malignant this movement is, they came apart at the seams when Indiana passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. RIFRA, they call it. And all it was was saying that people who might have convictions that are different than the LGBT agenda could have a day in court to be heard rather than immediately find immediately shut down, immediately forced to do something they didn't want to do. And I want to say this too. I think that if we're going to lead with love, that that will mean for some florists who are Christians, that they may well have the liberty to sell flowers for a wedding. If they do that in liberty and not as compromise. Others will not have that liberty and will have the conviction to say, I cannot do that, and then be willing to pay the price. You need to understand where I stand. We will not give in to that agenda in this church, although I pray that we can communicate why lovingly. And we will begin to think through as leaders how can we further protect our church from successful litigation, anybody can sue, but successful litigation that might come to us because of the biblical stand we've taken here. But I've got to plead with you, brothers and sisters, we cannot take that stand with our arms folded. We cannot take that stand with our fists clenched. 
We've got to take that stand with our arms outstretched, our hands open. Because you see, Jesus Christ in the gospel said to us, before we were saved, I love you, but you're wrong. You're dead in your sins. And it was our responding to that by the help of the Spirit, repenting of our sins, repenting of where we were wrong, confessing faith in Jesus that he received us into his life. And as Joshua mentioned a while ago, this battle will only be won as Christians individually and as the church, as church bodies collectively, are gracious and loving. Teach your children it is wrong. Show them in the scripture. Read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 to them and talk about the list of sins, Paul says there, that you will not inherit the kingdom if you're guilty of these. And there are other lists, other places. And show them where Paul goes on to say, but such were some of you that you don't have to, as the Pharisees would say, or the law would say, you're wrong, and if you will get right, I'll love you. You don't have to come that path. Because Jesus said to us, I love you, and you're in sin. Teach our children the joy and the wonder and the splendor of, of heterosexual relationships. A man with a woman, married in the sight of God, two believers joined in the Lord. Prepare them because they'll Unless the Lord returns or brings revival, they will face the full fury of this. Just recently this week, our president sent out a decree that conversion counseling must stop. What that means is a parent who discovers that a child, a son has developed same-sex attraction or a daughter has developed same-sex attraction for that parent to take that child to a counselor, a pastor, to talk with him or her and help them to find their, their way back to a biblical path, that that is a violation of that child's civil rights. This is where we live. We should not be discouraged and undone, however, because you see, here's the secret. Christianity historically has never flourished when it has been the dominant culture. It always flourishes when it is the persecuted culture. You see, if we want to see the gospel advance like wildfire in this nation, as it is in, in other places in the world where the heat is really intense on them, we've got to recognize that the path through that will be persecution. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you and surprise them. Stun them with your declaration of love for them because God is love and he loved us first and gave Jesus Christ to live and die and rise again for us. And that our hope in loving them, or loving any sinner who needs to come to Christ, or any sinner who's lost his or her way and wandered away from Christ, that our hope is that if God will grant us gospel love for people, that these people will see the beauty of Christ, the glory of the gospel, the power of salvation, and come to the Lord or come back to the Lord and be renewed and cleansed and strengthened and be able to say and such was I but I've been washed I've been sanctified the blood of Christ has cleansed me that's the battle we fight those are the weapons we use and I believe God will bless if we'll take that to heart Continue to search the scriptures. Stand on the Bible confidently, tenderly, 
lovingly. Refuse to fuss or fight. Simply offer words of love pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ as the place where he declared to me and to you, I love you, but you're wrong. And he opened our eyes to see his glory, the glory of the gospel, salvation by grace through faith, and drew us to himself. And that, after all, is what we want to see, what we should want to see happen to every person in sin, even in this sin that has now become a political agenda. Lead with love. In our relationships, lead with love. In your ministries, lead with love. Lead worship with love. Teach with love. Preach with love. Share the gospel, leading with love. And if we will lead with love, we will, I think, be tremendously amazed at how God will melt hard hearts Turn them from our enemies to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray together.